Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, everybody. It's time for our annual audience survey. We'd really like to hear from you. It helps us understand our audience better, know what you like and don't like, how you listen to the show. It also helps us tell advertisers what kind of people listen. But I promise you, your feedback is always kept personally anonymous. All you have to do is visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It'll just take a few minutes and it'll help us make Twit even better. We really appreciate your support and any help you can give us, twit.tv slash survey. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, February 27th, 2016. This is episode 1265. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by NatureBox. NatureBox is dedicated to making smart, delicious snacking easy. They have over 100 ridiculously delicious snacks and get delivered directly to your doorstep. Visit naturebox.com slash twit to get 50% off your first box now. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click screen rate and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Hi. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, all that jizz as. 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. of A. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still call me because uh, it's toll free. That means you can call Skype out for free. 8888. Ask Leo. We do get callers from all over the world. That's cool. Website is, and you should know this because anytime I talk about something, you don't have to scramble to get a pencil and paper. If you say, oh, I want to know where that, I want to get that, oh, I want, no, it's all on the website, techguylabs.com. Easy to find anything you want there because we divide it up by show, by hour, by question. There's audio and video of the show after the show's over. We put that up there, YouTube video and all that stuff. Let's see what else. Oh, it's free. You don't have to sign up. You don't ask for a password or a email or anything just free just free this is i'm going to mention this because it's not going to get much coverage and it's going to blow away but remember samsung winning i'm mean, sorry losing a billion dollar judgment against apple apple wanted 2.2 uh, .2 billion dollars saying samsung had infringed on eight of its software patents things like swipe to unlock we own that you can't do that and the jury uh awarded them not $2.2 billion, but uh, $119 million awarded to Apple, saying, Apple, you're right, Samsung. Samsung stole that. They'd already uh, won a, a suit against Samsung for, for design, for uh, what they call trade dress. The suit said that Apple, and that was the bigger one, I think that was a billion-dollar judgment, that, uh, that, Apple's, uh, that Samsung tried to copy Apple's look so that people would be confused and buy Samsung phones instead of iPhones. Now, that's kind of an insult. Would you be confused? It looks just like an iPhone. I'll take that. <laughs> you know the difference. So it's kind of an insult, but okay, whatever. They lost that one. Uh, on Friday, a three-judge panel ruled that two of the patents shouldn't have been given to Apple in the first place, and Samsung didn't infringe on the third and reversed the decision. You're not going to probably hear a lot about that. You hear a lot about... Apple won, Samsung stole, just so you know. The high court said, yeah, you know what? That's not a patent. That's not a good patent. Swipe to unlock? Come on. That's not a patent. Get patent that. The software patents have been fairly uh, controversial for years. I mean, until very recently, a patent had to be a, uh, 
a, 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 a mechanism, a thing, a process like um, vulcanizing rubber, you know, taking rubber, pro heating it and making it stronger. That's you can get a patent for. The software that controls the vulcanizing machine, that's not, that's just an expression. That's like speech. In fact, courts have often held that that's speech. And uh, it wasn't until recently that the patent office said, yeah, you could patent that too. And that's really been an unfortunate turn of events. Gave rise to a, a multi billion dollar industry uh, of people suing for licenses that they didn't even invent, they just bought. They call it patent trolling. Uh, I mention this because Apple has filed its response. Man, this is a complicated story, and I, I, uh, I'm sure for a lot of people it's very confusing, this idea that Apple might not help the FBI unlock the phone used by one of the shooters. Uh, the other two phones the shooter, the husband and wife shooters in San Bernardino used were destroyed before the, the uh, incident. They knew there was something on there, so they just destroyed it. The third was owned by the, it was his was Farouk's business phone, and he was owned by the San Bernardino County Department of Health, and so uh, probably he just didn't he knew it was being monitored. He, I would guess he just didn't use it for anything important. Um, nevertheless, uh, he did lock it as most of us do. In fact, I think by default you do right. It's pretty hard not to lock an iPhone with a four or six digit code. They kind of make you now. Uh, he had updated it to iOS 8 the lower, or iOS 9, I'm not sure which, but the, the strong encryption. So the phone was scrambled. And the FBI is not asking Apple to unscramble the phone. Uh, contrary to what some might have said, there's no back door involved here. This isn't about trying to, because Apple can't. Apple's worked very hard to make sure that, that law enforcement can't come to them and say, here's a phone, give me everything that's on it. Apple's response is, we can't, we don't know. We don't, we, it's strong encryption. We don't have a key. Now, I think down the road, law enforcement is going to really push Apple to put a golden backdoor key in that. I'll talk about why that's a bad idea. But that's not what this one's about. This one is saying, you have to. what we want you to do is modify this phone, put a different operating system on it in such a way that we can unlock, we can brute force unlock it. See, it's strong encrypted, but the, the four or six digit passcode isn't very strong if you think about it. There's only 10,000 possible passcodes with a four digit. There's only uh, 99, what is it, 990, 1 million possibles with a six digit. Uh, and so if you had a machine that could guess, you know, very quickly, especially with a four digit code, you could unlock it. So that's kind of a weak front door is what that is. That's a weak front door that Apple put on there because it's convenient. You don't want to have to enter a long 16-letter number punctuation mark password every time you want to turn on the phone. You don't want to do that. That would make it strong, by the way. And you do have that option, I believe. Certainly you do on Android. You can turn on encryption and turn on a lengthy password, and then there's nothing anybody could do to make that phone unencryptable. That's it. It's done. It's done. But because we have this weak front door... The FBI went to Apple and said, well, because Apple did put some protections on it. For instance, there's a five-second delay between every code, every time you try. And while it's not the default, you can turn on this rule that says, and if somebody guesses wrong 10 times, we'll erase the phone. The FBI doesn't know, but they're worried that that might be turned on on Farouk's phone. So they've gone to Apple and said, look, here's what we want you to do. We want you to modify the phone so that there's no more 10-second delay or five second delay. We want to be able to enter passcodes as quickly as possible, and we don't. We really don't want it to delete uh, anything after ten. We just want it to let us keep guessing. And then it'd be really nice if we didn't have to tap it with our fingers. If we could just write this software in such a way that we could plug in a device or use Bluetooth and do it uh, automatically, and then we could guess that pretty quickly. Even if it's a million possibilities, we could guess it. You know, in a few weeks. Apple says no. We don't want to do that. We don't. First of all, we'd have to write new software. And compelling, and, and the, one of the arguments they used against the court, which I, to the court in their plea on uh, Friday, was interesting because it said, uh, you can't compel speech, and we think software is speech, and the government can't tell me or anybody what to say. That's true, right? That, we're protected. So we, it's a different use of the First Amendment, but it's true. It is, the government can't compel you to say, I like Ike. There's no, they can't make a law to do that. And so Apple's saying that's what they're doing. They're, asked, they're forcing us to say something we don't want to say. 
Now, they've made another argument in public. Tim Cook, uh, when he was interviewed by ABC, made a ver he said it, this would be the software equivalent of cancer. If we were to write this program and it were to leak out, then others could unlock your phone, not just the government, but bad guys, bad actors, other governments. It would, and and he, I think it's a strong case, a very strong case, that privacy and security are, uh, are a public safety issue. You put stuff on that phone, nobody should be able to get access, no bad guy should be able to get access to. And it's Tim Cook's position, Apple's position, that if we were to unlock Farouk's phone, it would make that easier. That's wrong, by the way. And they know it's wrong. They can and would, every, every firmware modification made to any iPhone is distinct and unique to that iPhone. That software, even if it were published publicly, couldn't be used against another iPhone. It's only, it would be dedicated to that phone. More importantly, and more what they're worried about is the precedent it would set, and then other law enforcement agencies, even foreign governments, would come to them saying, "Well, you did it for you did it for the FBI. Now do it for us." And that's what they're most afraid of, in a nutshell. And security is important. Keeping this stuff private is important, I believe. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's my magic man there. Look at that. Actually, so magic woman. It's the Amazon Echo. I brought one home. Now we have a studio Echo. So now when I say her name and everybody at home goes, Leo, stop talking to my Echo, she'll respond here too. 8888 Ask Leo. I think this may be the hot, might have been the hottest product, in my opinion, of 2015. This was a revolutionary product. This little black tube that you talk to, the Amazon Echo. It's a little pricey. I think they're at 180 bucks now. Just mm. a little, yeah, it's a lot, a lot to pay. Hello, Heather Hammond. Hey, I'm worried that she's going to take my job. Is she going to be more famous than me? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. You know, I noticed when you have one of these things, it's like you're talking to your house mm -hmm. or the FBI and NSA, and uh, <laughs> or both. And so you kind of start to think, oh, my house should be listening all the time and I should be able to say other things. And I've started talking to my house now. Um, like, you know, when the wind is blowing and the rain is rattling, the window's like, knock it off. Hey, house, quiet. <laughs> quiet shut down. up. She Echo responds to shut up, but not the house, unfortunately. Hmm. You get used to the idea that you could talk to your surroundings and have it do things. Amazing thing I did this weekend. I ran out of batteries. So I said, hey, Echo, uh, send me some AA batteries. And the Echo came back and said, well, <laughs> you last, last batteries you ordered on Amazon were these. Is that Would you like me to reorder those? And I said, yes. And that was it. Two days later, I got batteries. Good Lord. It's nice to be able to ask your house to refill stuff. Yes, it is. And Amazon likes it because you have to buy it from Amazon. You know what the beauty of that is? Is that you're doing it while it's top of mind instead of exactly. like me. I've got these Put that lists. on a to-do list. Yep. Yeah. And it's a personal assistant. Do this, do that. Okay, done. Taken care of. She'll Ugh. tell you jokes. Really? Yeah. She'll break wind if you ask her. Huh. I'm not kidding. What? I didn't make that up. Uh, <laughs> there's all sorts I of... I don't need a boyfriend now. <laughs> I wish I... You've been lying. You've been lining up. <laughs> You've been lining up the calls all for the last 10, 15 minutes, all morning. And I'm sure we have some lovely people who oh, want to talk to sure. me. Who should I start with? Well, Alan in Honolulu. I, I can't steal his thunder. You've just got to hear what I've he has to say to you. I've just got to hear it. Thank you, Heather Amon. Hello, Alan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Morning, Leo. How are you today? Very well. How are you? Well, I'm, I'm doing better now because... The reason for my call is that I've been listening to you for a while, and I always take your advice. But you know, I thought you were—I thought I was being smarter than you. And, and never, uh, never—it's not possible. I am the Donald Trump of technology, <laughs> and it has to do with backing up your data. Uh oh. Because you always talk about having three sources of your data, yeah. And I thought I could eliminate one because what I got myself was a network access storage device. At Very smart. That's good. That's nice. Eight. That's an in-house backup device that uh, is on the network. It's basically a computer without a keyboard, mouse, or monitor that just kind of sucks up data on schedule all the time. 
And in fact, mine was a RAID 5 array. Ooh. No, no. There yeah. are four disk drives that yeah. work together that, with parity, back themselves up. And if one drive fails, then you'll be notified and you can just slide a new drive in there and it will reconfigure itself and everything will be fine. Yeah. Well, that's not what happened. Oh, no. What happened? I had one of my drives fail. Yeah. But, oh, well, I have, and, and I've had this for several years. It's no problem. I put a new drive in, and it started backing itself up, and it got about a third of the way through it, and then one of the other drives crashed. Oh, no. Yeah, see, that's what you don't want in a RAID 5. One drive it can handle. Right. Two drives, that's no. not so good. No, not at all. And so I was sitting there wondering, how am I going to tell my wife that <laughs> every picture that we own... You, mean you didn't have another? You only had one copy? Yeah. See, that's okay. I so I thought I was being smart. Yeah, but that's I not even. But four drives that were. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no. I thank you for falling on your sword for me to make a point. Well, the, the other point I want to make is, is that there are, as you often say, there are companies out there that you can send failed drives to that can do oh, recovery. Yeah. And I bit the bullet and did it. And, and I was able to recover my data. No kidding. Yes. They were able, that's a hard thing to do. They're rebuilding a RAID array is more complicated than just any individual disk. That's great. I, I hope you're sitting down because when I tell you how much it cost, but I had to do it. <laughs> how much did it cost? 11000 What? <laughs> I was going to guess four. I 11 know. That was the cheapest quote I got because I went to several different companies. Well, that and it must have been because it's a RAID and there's two drives, so it's a little more complicated. That is a outrage, but it was worth it. So I have learned my lesson. Wow! Because I got myself a RAID six array. <laughs> oh, that'll <laughs> fix is, it. <laughs> which is five disk drives. Yeah. And now two, any, any two, two can fail. fail. Yeah. But remember, but also, it's I'm also going to be using online backup. Yeah, it's possible, uh, and this is an important point, that if, say, the electrical, and I bet you in Hawaii you have power outages and thunderstorms and things. If the electrical fried that thing, it wouldn't matter how many disks you have in there, the thing is fried. So it's still a single thing. And it's not a backup. By the way, this is the most important thing you said was we only had one copy. It's never a backup. Had you had the originals on your hard drive and your computer, you wouldn't freak out. But it's never a backup if there's only one copy. I'm not to scold you because I know you. you... You're absolutely right. Yeah. My, my thinking was flawed, yeah. and it was not. Yeah. Now, quick question on online backup because I know that Carbonite is one of your sponsors, but I actually used to have Carbonite, but since it's tied with my business and it's on a server, it was quite pricey. Yeah, you don't have and to. You, I was... It's cheaper for one computer. It's like 60 bucks a year, which means, let's see, $11,000 divided by $60. I don't even want to do this calculation. <laughs> well, actually, my carbonite... You could have 183 years <laughs> of carbonite <laughs> for that cost. But... Well, the carbonite backup for my exchange server, which this was... It's more crazy. expensive because it's a server. But, yeah. but you know what? I'm, 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 this is not an ad for carbonite. Any offline backup will work. Um, in fact, what I suggest is, as you mentioned, three copies... Because then, then you've got double redundancy, and you really you're never going to have a problem. Um, but it is sometimes happens. It's really unusual that maybe your RAID array gets fried, and you can't restore from your offline backup, and suddenly you're really really out of luck. Three is pretty good. Two different kinds of medium, and one in the cloud is the rule. The three to one backup rule. I can't take credit for that. My friend Peter. So Cole, as I am now have my my data back and I have my RAID six and I'm all set to do my online backup and I have used Carbonite before, but I was just curious if you've heard or have any feedback on Amazon's system for uh, yeah for yeah. Let me we're going to take a break because it's the bottom of the hour, but let, let me come back and talk about other ways you can you can get this very important off-site backup and it doesn't and if it's a lot of data cloud may not be the right answer because you have to upload it uh so let me talk about that when we come back there are uh, multiple ways to solve this problem leo laporte the tech guy here he is scott wilkinson our home theater geek hope you had a wonderful time with joanna i did up in we the, had where, a wonderful where did time. you go 
Uh, nice we weekend. went to the Mission Inn in Riverside. Very nice. Which, uh, you know, Riverside, okay, so it's not necessarily the hot the garden spot, spot of the world, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. But, it, you know, the Mission Inn itself is a destination. It's a wonderful place. And we had spa day with massages, and oh, it was great. Just great. Very nice. Well, we missed you, but I'm glad you're back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back, too. It's fine. Scott's Wonderful. our home theater guru, which means he talks about home theater every week on the show. He's also the editor-in-chief of the fabulous AVS Forum, which is, uh, you know what? You've really upgraded that. It was always a great place to go as a forum to get user information, but now the editorial side of it is just fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We work really hard on it, and I, I feel really good about it's it. It's like a magazine. I mean, it really is uh, very useful. I hope that's not an insult to say like a magazine. No, not at all. In fact, I've spent most of my career in print, you know, okay, as a print good. jockey, as I said. So, you know, that's that's great. <laughs> he also hosts, uh, for those of you who are audio inclined, as many radio people are, uh, a great podcast, The Home Theater Geeks Show, twit.tv. That's my podcast network, twit.tv slash HTG for Home Theater Geeks. And every week it's a it's a revelation. It's wonderful. I always get great people on the show to yeah. talk about all kinds of different stuff. So, you know, I got, okay, so you've talked, we've talked many times, uh, especially on the podcast, about the high-res music. The idea that mm -hmm. even a CD is not recorded with the best possible reproduction. That the, it, ideally, I mean, well, people who had analog discs said, you know, the nice thing about a vinyl record is... It's pure analog, so it captures the entire waveform to the degree that it can and reproduces it. I'm not sure I agree with that, yeah, but I understand. But you, you just said it, to the degree it can. Yeah. So uh, some people have proposed, well, our, our CDs are recorded or pressed, maybe not recorded, but pressed. Correct. Uh, with 16 bits of data for every sample and 44,100 samples per second. Correct. And a lot of people say that that's a good choice. That says that's right. You know, it, it covers the twenty to two, twenty to twenty thousand hertz frequency range very adequately. According to the yep. Nyquist theorem, it's more than adequate to do that. Yep. Yep. Um, but but some recording uh, engineers believe higher bit rates would be better instead yep. of sixteen bits per sample. Maybe twenty four bits. That'd be a lot more. More a than lot more. more than you know twice as much. It's it's algorithm logarithmic. Right. Um, or exponential, I should say. But uh, exponential, yeah. Uh, and then maybe, maybe at a, a slightly higher sample rate. I'm of the opinion or, that or a lot higher sample. Or a rate, lot. 96. Well, there's some. We can buy 96, which is double, or even 192, which is yep. whatever. And now they're starting to do 384. No, don't stop. It stop the insanity. <laughs> so remember, Neil Young really was pushing this. Yeah, a musician who is music. yeah a musician who is by his own admission mostly deaf. <laughs> from, from years of rock and roll. However, he said, we want you to hear the music we hear when we record. So yep. he made this Pono player, which is capable of reproducing 192 by 24, 192,000 samples a second, 24 bits. Yep. Yep. Um, and now he's put something called the revealer on it, which is an well, interesting I don't think idea. I heard about that. Yeah, oh, so he, when that? he was demonstrating it to other musicians, he had uh, his own copy of the revealer. What the revealer does is takes an individual track and plays it back as... A 128 uh, bit per second, 128 kilobit per second MP3, mm -hmm. 128 kilobit per second AAC, mm -hmm. uh, a CD quality, and then a high res quality. Oh, so you, that's very interesting. So, so you can compare them directly. Can't tell the difference. I cannot tell the difference. Ah, so fascinating. Wow. <laughs> I was now, unfortunately, there's only one track, Heart of Gold by Neil Young, which is not, by the way, is an analog recording from uh, like 100,000 years ago. So that's probably exactly not the right. best choice for uh, this. But, you know, Neil, uh, <laughs> and it is his own music. So, you know, he doesn't have to get rights to it. Um, right. But I would love to see more revealer tracks because maybe it'd be easier to hear the difference. I have to say, when you're listening with a really good reproduction, and by the way, the Pono player is good not just because it do high res, can do high res, but because it has a very, very good digital to analog converter, has very, very good headphone amps. Right. So that makes a difference too. And I'm listening on thousand uh, dollar electrostatic Hi-Fi Man 560 headphones, which are very good. Oh, headphones. beautiful headphones. Really sound good. And yeah. they have a, a balanced on the Pono player. You can use two jacks and get a, a, a ba and balanced input out of the player. The Amplifier is designed to handle, so I got the special hundred dollar cable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't want to talk. I mean, this, we're, at this point, we're like oh, fifteen hundred really bucks. Went it. 
Yeah, you really went hmm. through it. You wanted to really see if there Can't was going to be an audible difference. Tell the difference. <laughs> but I'm almost 60. Of course I can. Right. Um, exactly. Well, you know, you we we talk about this a lot. You know, as you age, you lose your high frequency hearing ability. It's just a natural fact of life. That's all there is to it. Yeah. So we can't you and I can't hear much above 15k if that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so having the extra frequency range is lost on most people except, you know, babies. <laughs> and they don't care anyway. <laughs> I've done this before. I remember going at the Dolby. I was walking by Dolby Studios in San Francisco one day. A guy comes out at the door. He goes, Psst, Leo. I said, what? <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is not, I'm not exaggerating. Psst, oh, Leo. My. I said, what? He said, come in here. Oh, my God. Yes, sir. And we went into their beautiful <laughs> uh, sound reproduction room with Rebel speakers, some the best speakers made, some yep. say. Yep. And he said, look, I'm going to play for you uh, this Steely Dan cut. I'm going to play it from an MP3. I'm going to play it from a CD. I don't think he had high-res audio. And I'm going to A-B it so you don't know what you're listening to and see if you can tell the difference. And even then, I couldn't tell the difference. Now, I think since then, I have been taught what to listen for. Because you listen for symbols. There's certain things that 128 kilobit MP3 cannot do very well. Symbols. But yeah. There's yeah. an openness very and airiness, yes. which I think is also yeah. related to high frequency. Now, as right. an old man, I can't hear that anymore anyway, so it doesn't. <laughs> but at the time, I, I was able to tell it. Not in that studio, I couldn't. Mm. But that's very, but by the way, that Steely Dan, uh, I think it was Asia. It was, it's a very, it's a relatively simple uh, cut. There's not a lot going on. It's not a symphony. True. And yet, uh, Steely Dan, Donald Fagan in particular, is such a perfectionist in the studio that you know that the original source material is going to be impeccable. Perfectly recorded. And you sure yep. can feel that, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, maybe I'm just too old. But I just, I think this <laughs> revealer thing is an interest. If you can find somebody with a Pono, get them to update the firmware. And, yeah, with this revealer thing. That is very tell. good. Yeah. A lot of people talk about, uh, you know, re re recording in this higher resolution, 192 or 96 kilohertz, 24 bit. And you don't necessarily hear anymore, but you, you, as you said, it's kind of an airier, more open feeling. Plus the fact that all of these players and recordings, you need to have a filter that, that prevents higher frequencies than, it, than the system can record from getting in and getting out. So you have this filter at, at a CD rate, the filter has to be very steep and that can cause some phase problems. But at well, higher resolutions, the filter can be more gentle. And that's another thing that might cause the uh, high res audio to sound better. Yeah. As somebody, P.S. Chops pointed out in the chat room, it's really uh, the sad mm -hmm. irony of life that by the time you can afford that Italian sports car, or the mm -hmm. high-fidelity audio equipment, you're really mm -hmm. too old to appreciate it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Geeks, twit.tv slash HTG. This is the kind of stuff. What did you do this past week? It was good. I forgot. Oh, it was great. It was uh, people coming back from the Hollywood Professional Alliance tech retreat, talking about everything they learned there about high dynamic range. Movies and all sorts of are things. getting better and better. Yep. Find out more uh, on the podcast and, of course, at avsforum.com. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk again next week. You betcha. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now we'll get to offline backup when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Can't go wrong with Getty Lee. My humble opinion. Musical director Nathan Staten doing a great job. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. So we were talking about offline. Now, let me once again reiterate what's most important about backup. And again, full credit to Peter Krogh, who is a friend of mine, a great photographer, and working with the Association of Professional Photographers and the Library of Congress has a great website on uh, best practices for photographers, workflow practices and, and everything. Um, but And he's also written something called the DAM book, the Digital Asset Management book. But at what applies to photographers really applies to everybody. Uh, if you think about it, if you're a professional photographer and you shoot a wedding, the burden on not losing those photographs is as high as it gets, right? I mean, that's I mean, next to state secrets, the bride's pictures are <laughs> the most potential nightmare scenario of you know data loss because you're not going to stage the wedding again, and that's that's a once in a lifetime. That is it. So. Uh, 
I think what photographers think about and do in this regard really applies to all of us. If you have data you don't want to lose, then you got to think about this. So he calls it his three, two, one backup. And I, I don't think there's a better uh, description of what to do for backup. He says three copies, not one, not two, not but three. One copy is not a backup. Uh, you could put it on a drive labeled backup, but it's not the backup. It's one copy. Two copies is usually enough, right? Because it's redundant, but it's not unheard of for kind of serial failures. And there's one particular failure you can think about if the house burns down. You've got two copies, but they're all in the house. That's bad. So three copies, one of which is off-site, is somewhere else. Now, if it's a lot of data, if it's terabytes of data, the best way to do this is not on the Internet, but on a big hard drive that you periodically swap out and take to work or send to your mom or whatever. Have another, have it in another place. Um, and it's kind of an um, unpleasant exercise, but think about what's the worst that can happen. And whether at that point you would care. If, a, if an asteroid hits you and work and destroys everything, do you really care about the photos anymore? Probably not. So, so you know, that's kind of the exercise. Could your house burn down? Possibly. Would you still care about, care about the data on your hard drive? Very possibly. So uh, I, I really like this 3 one backup. Three copies, two different forms of media. That's the two part. So you're not all all in on DVD backup or all in on hard drive backup. One of each would be nice. And then one should be in the cloud. Cloud counts as a third kind of backup, right? Off-site. Actually, it's not cloud. It's off-site. Cloud's useful because you, can, you don't have to get up and go out of the house and bring the data uh, to your mom's. Plus, it can be more timely. I mean, if you exchange hard drives every week with work, that means potentially you could lose as much of a week's worth of photos or whatever. Photos get, have gotten easy. Photos are easy now, thanks to Google, uh, Amazon, Flickr. There are a lot of places where you have virtually infinite photo backup. And I would certainly consider that. Google Photos will automatically back up every photo on your computer, on any computer, on your uh, phones, on your tablets, free, forever. It's free if you have uh, if you allow them to compress, turn them into compressed JPEGs. But you can also pay for storage, still very affordable, for uncompressed originals. I mentioned last week something from Seagate called Live, L-Y-V-E. Those require a Seagate drive, um, but that's kind of a good way, similar to Google, except you own the backup. It's not on Google's cloud, it's on your cloud or your hard drives. There are many other ways to do this. Amazon, uh, our caller asked about Amazon. Amazon has a couple of ways to do this. They have something called Glacier, which is really interesting. For stuff you don't care, it's slow moving like a glacier. You can back up the data. It takes a while to get it back. It might take as much as half a day to get it back. That works fine as long as you don't use it a lot. It can get expensive if you use it, but, it's, but you can even send them a hard drive, which is nice. So if you have a lot of storage, it's very cheap. The storage itself is very cheap. It's the retrieval that will cost you. But by that time... If you're looking at an $11,000 disk restore bill, spending $25 or $100 on retrieval doesn't seem like much. So Glacier is an interesting thing to look at. Glacier is not really designed, though, for continual backup. And that's why Carbonite and some of our sponsors, there are other companies that do this too, Backblaze and Sugar Sink. There are many companies that do this. Uh, kind of continuous in the background backup. Those are very convenient. You don't have to set anything up. It just kind of works. Um, but, it should, but even that isn't enough by itself. You want to have that plus a local hard drive backup plus the originals on your computer. You, you really want to think about your backup strategy. So um, to answer the, your, your question specifically, Bruce, I, I, uh, or was it Bruce? I can't remember. Um, I definitely think Amazon's a good choice if you can figure out a convenient and easy way to get the data up there that you will continually update it. This is the other thing. Backup has you have it's no good if you don't back it if you don't continue to back up. So you have to have some simple mechanism, preferably automated, where you don't think about it. Bruce on the line from Irvine, California. Hi, Bruce Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey Leo, I've been listening to you for a long time and thank you for everything. You do thank a great you. service. My pleasure. I'm lucky to be able to do this. So I think you've hit the issue for me, but to set the context to help others, um, I do a lot of writing and I you and I travel a lot. And I usually I'm doing it remotely. 
um, and I'm just VPNing, if that's the right word, into my um, environment at work, which is a Microsoft environment using Exchange. And I've used an iPad, uh, the latest version of iPad, and there's there's ways to do it. But with the, all the key, I'm a keyboarder. Uh, with all the keyboarding, there's some there's some functionality that doesn't really work very well. I've used a Surface Pro three, and it's fine, but it's clumsy the way the, the arrow got arrow. Well, the way it's designed, it's got that weird 45 degree angle. You can't really. It, the keyboard's a little flimsy. It's just not great. So, the nice thing about a Chromebook, from my point of view, is they're inexpensive. So it's not a you know buying a Surface is a fairly big expense. Uh, it's overkill for just VPN. For yeah. Promoting it, really, right? what you almost just want is a terminal, right? A Chromebook is yeah, exactly. the right price. It's also super secure, which I really like. Uh, Google made Chrome OS. It's based on Linux. It's uh, On top of that is the Chrome browser. Uh, and it's, it's really locked down in so many significant ways. It's one of the most secure operating systems out there. And should anything go wrong... There's a feature built into it called Power Wash that, that just erases everything. People can't modify your hard drive because it has a secure boot. If it sees that the boot has been changed in any way, it won't start up. You'll have to power wash it. There's so many good things about it. So it's kind of ideal for a VPN. Uh, now, and, and is there any functionality issues between, between the Chrome OS and the what I'm remoting into? The way you do it, and I, what I would suggest is if you can find a Chromebook, you can try just to make sure it'll work with your setup. But they, they absolutely do. In fact, there's a help page on the Chromebook that says how to set up private virtual networks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it really, you go into the settings, you add a connection, and you can add OpenVPN or L2TP. If your server uses one of those standard protocols, you're golden. You will also have to install certificates, which will be provided to you by your IT department. At that point, it should be transparent and continuous. And you won't even know it. You'll just be using it. But I would, I, would I, I think your IT department should have some experience with this. And if they don't, they should spend 200 bucks, and get a Chromebook, and make sure it works properly into their uh, standards. But it's, it, it is built in, yes. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, everybody. So glad to see you all on this lovely Saturday. At least it's lovely here in L.A. Uh, I'm not quite sure how it is everywhere else. Uh, Flashpoint Cube and I have been having a nice chat on the uh, in the chat room. Um, he wanted to know why I thought 3D TV was dead. And the, the reason simply is that uh, Vizio last year dropped it from all their TVs. This year, Samsung is dropping it from all their TVs. And LG went from having about 40% of its total TV line 3D capable to now this year 20%. So it's on its way out. We didn't see Heidner hair of it at CES except for... In the LG booth, they had, outside the LG booth, they had a little sort of 3D multi-screen tiled display sort of thing going on. But it wasn't in their main display, in the main entrance to the booth, which it has been in years past. And, uh, you know, I why that is, they're just dropping it, these companies. I think it's always been a problematic thing because people just don't like wearing those glasses, at least at home. Now, here's the weird thing, that 3D is still alive and well and doing great in commercial cinema. They're releasing tons of movies in 3D in the commercial cinema. But dig this, when, you, when the Blu-ray comes out, more often than not these days, it's not 3D. It doesn't have a 3D version of a movie that was in 3D in the theaters. Uh, so I, I just think market forces and the companies that put out this stuff have sort of decided, you know what, 3D is kind of over for the home. It's still something that draws people into theaters. And uh, interesting, you know, maybe that's, I, I can't say that's collusion to say that, uh, oh, well, the TV manufacturers and the studios releasing Blu-rays have all decided to get rid of 3D so that it's something that the movie theaters, the like commercial cinemas, can have that the home theater doesn't have. Uh, but, uh, you know, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Now, people always ask me when I talk about high dynamic range or HDR, well, isn't that just the next 3D? And my answer is no, 
absolutely not. That is a critically important thing that is going to be more and more important as we move forward, partly because it doesn't require any glasses, right? You can just watch it. And it makes a huge improvement in the picture. Uh, we were talking on last week's Home Theater Geeks about applying high dynamic range to 1080p, to regular high definition, not even 4K or ultra high definition. And that makes a lot of sense because you can see such a vast, a dramatic improvement in the picture quality. In fact, it takes on a 3D dimensional kind of look. So it's really, uh, I think that it's very, very important. And so that's not another the, other, the next 3D. It's going to be here now for a long time, and I think rightly so. Uh, I just posted a thing on AVS that I hope uh, if you're in the market for a TV, if you're in the market for a new TV, go check out my post on AVS called HDR Capable Displays. And what I did was I made a list of all the TVs from 2015 and the ones announced at Cedia for 2016 that have high dynamic range or HDR capability. And you can go uh, buy one of these TVs and there isn't a lot of HDR content yet, but there is some. There's quite a bit on MGO. There's uh, some on Netflix. Uh, Amazon Instant Video has some. And that's only going to keep getting more and more. And now that we have Ultra HD Blu-ray, uh, that we have the first player on the market, the Samsung UBD K8500, we have several titles. I don't remember how many, a dozen maybe, uh, titles that are out there on, on Ultra HD Blu-ray disc. Um, and the studios are promising over 100 by the end of the year. And those, for the most part, I don't think all of them will be HDR, but most of them will be. And when you see that, and as much as I write about it, I know that it doesn't make nearly the impact that when you actually see it. The when, when you, if you can actually see it in action, that makes a huge impact, much more than any words can. So, but I recommend to people who are shopping for a new TV to get one that is HDR capable because you are getting ready for a future of much better video images than you have seen up till now. Even with high definition, even with uh, Pi Pioneer Kuro plasmas or, or OLED, OLED is looks fantastic with high di high dynamic range content it doesn't get as bright as lcd tvs so you, you it doesn't stand up to as much ambient light in the room but if you have a light controlled room and you have the money to afford an oled which is pretty expensive still uh you're gonna get this stunning picture it's amazing picture so that's uh one thing i wanted to mention uh, another thing i wanted to mention anybody in the bay area I've been lamenting that there is no, there has been no Dolby Cinema with Dolby Vision, High Dynamic Range, and Atmos Sound. The first one just opened last week. It's in Fremont, which is kind of down near San Jose. So uh, the Twisters in Petaluma, that's a long trek for them to go see a movie. But um, in the case of a really important movie or a really big blockbuster or something, I would recommend the trip. And there's going to be others in uh, in the Bay Area coming up later this year as well. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew about that. So, um, yeah, we were also talking, I think, uh, Flashpoint Cubed. No, it was Error was talking about uh, 4K TV and uh, Direct TV and so on. Direct TV, Dish, Cable, Verizon, Fios, none of them offer 4K uh, broadcasting yet. Uh, also over the air, what's called ATSC 3.0. Uh, that's not 4K yet and probably won't be for another year or two. The only way you can get 4K and HDR uh, content is by streaming um, or by on Ultra HD Blu-ray. But in terms of receiving it into your home, uh, streaming is, is the only way to do it at this point. Beatmaster asked about my Deadpool experience. It is in Dolby Vision, high dynamic range, and Atmos. I didn't go see it. It just sounded too juvenile and too violent for me. I, the Revenant certainly wasn't juvenile, but it was way too violent for me. Uh, and I've heard the, some of the similar sorts of comments about Deadpool. My colleague Mark Henninger went and saw it and wrote about it on AVS, and that was fine. 
<laughs> By the way, uh, next Thursday on on Home Theater Geeks, uh, I'm doing a question and answer with the chat room with Mark Henninger. So anybody who has any questions uh, that I can't answer today in the next 37 seconds, uh, please tune in on Thursday, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time, 5 to 6 Eastern time. Uh, and I will be answering, Mark and I will be answering questions from the chat room. So do uh, do join us for that. I hope you will. Um, so All right. Thank see. you, Scotty. I think that's it. My pleasure. See you later. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, smart watches, anything in your uh, tech world. That's what I'm here to solve. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number, 888-827-5536. Let's get back to the phones. I want some more calls here. John in Mission Viejo. Hello, John. Leo Laporte. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm a long-time listener. Enjoy your show. Well, great to have you. Thanks for listening. Yes, uh, my question is about uh, uh, about Windows Defender. I'm running uh, 8.1. Okay. And I'm just trying to turn on the Windows Defender, and I'm looking at the error message when I uh, do the search and bring up Windows Defender. It says this app has been uh, turned off and isn't monitoring your computer. And uh -oh. I'm trying to figure out how I turn on the app for Windows Defender. Huh. I yeah, because it's on normally. It's on by default. Yeah, well, I am running a third party for malware called yeah. Malware Bytes. Yeah, you probably don't want to do both. Ah, uh -huh. so there's going to be a conflict there. Yeah, what happens a lot of times uh, when you have multi... And these are really both antiviruses, let's face it. When you have multi multiple antiviruses is very often one sees the other as a virus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so it's probably... Um, I, you know, malware bytes is a little bit different than an antivirus. Um, if you if you uh, type in if you if you open Defender, uh, well, as as an administrator, you need to do that as an administrator. It says I, right. you can't turn me on. Well, um, yeah, I'm always the administrator. I'm you know everything I do on it, but uh, I can't even open Windows Defender. It wants me to open the app. For Windows Defender. Yeah, so you hit the start button, you start, you type Defender, right. hit, hit return, and you should get uh, Windows Defender. No, it doesn't even go that far. It just gives me the error message that the app is turned off. It's my suspicion that malware bytes might be blocking it. Ah. Look in the uh, control panel. That's where it normally hides. Can you see it in the control panel? Ah. Uh, Okay, let's see here. Let's get right to it. Uh, let's go uh, in the control panel. Let's see. That would be the one under control panel. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, it's about, you know, generally speaking, you don't want two security programs running at the same time because they fight. They war. Uh, okay. You know, because they both want to do kind of things that look virus-like, frankly. Okay. Uh, here's my. Let me give you kind of my bottom line on this. I, I don't run any third-party antivirus like malware bytes. Um, because I feel that Microsoft has built in adequate antivirus. It's not the best. Defender is by far not the best antivirus in the world. Um, mm -hmm. But it's adequate. And the reason I say it's adequate is no antivirus really is sufficient protection these days. Antiviruses work far less well than they used to because most of the attacks on your system are brand new, or what we call zero-day exploits. Those are the ones you really have to watch out for. And they uh, emerge so fast, thanks to the Internet, that they tend to come out long before the antivirus is updated. So you're vulnerable until that antivirus gets its updates, which is most of the time. In other words, an and furthermore, if an antivirus is not going to be truly annoying... It can't block you from doing things like installing applications. But guess what? Installing applications is how you put a virus on your system. So at best, at best, an antivirus is going to detect it after the fact. And often, the first thing that the virus does is disable the antivirus. So it's, in my opinion, a false uh, sense of security you get from antivirus software. Okay. So I would say take off malware bytes. Keep it around. Here's why you want it. When you, if you do get bit, it's nice to have that to scan and remove because it can remove a lot of minor infections. 
I would also caution you not to rely too hard on it because, unfortunately, um, it, it, that's another false sense of security. You can remove the visible infections and still have stuff on your system. Once your system's compromised, there's no real way to assure that it's not can, doesn't continue to be compromised. Merely removing what it can see doesn't mean your system's intact. It just means the rest of it could be as a root kit or in some way that malware bytes can't see or is not up to date to see. So you get, oh, I'm good. I, I just ran malware bytes. Everything's fine. And you've got a keyword, keystroke logger or a remote access Trojan on your machine. You just don't even know it. And you feel like you do because malware bytes gave you a clean bill of health or Defender did or whatever. So you know what you need to do? You just need to be really careful about what you run. Now, because you run as administrator, anything that you download and run has full access to your system. Fortunately, uh, I think Windows uh, UAC does a very good job of warning you before that happens. So UAC, even if you're running as administrator, will, will say, hey, wait a minute, I know you're administrator, but are you sure you want to do this? If you are an administrator, you'd have to enter a password. Because you are, you just have to click yes. But take those seriously. Really think about, why am I seeing that pop-up? Why is UAC warning me? What am I doing? And could it be dangerous? And did I mean to do that? One of the rules a lot of security experts use, I don't think it's sufficient, but that the, they, you know, there's no, th you know what, there's nothing sufficient. But one of the rules uh, is only, you know, only install software you went out and got that you wanted. Like, okay, it's time to update Flash. Go out to Adobe Flash. Go to the website. Know you're on the right website. Look at the certificate. Make sure it's HTTPS. You're downloading it from the right person and then run it. Even that's not enough. Really wonderful uh, article and show by Kevin Roos, who does a thing for uh, Fusion.com. He did a very dumb thing on purpose. <laughs> he went to hackers and uh, said, hack me. Now, he, he chose hacking experts who are what we call white ha hackers. They have all the skills of bad guys, but they use their skills for good, not evil. They do what's called often called pen testing or penetration testing. They say a company comes to them and says, okay, you're a skilled hacker. Tell us our vulnerabilities. That's a really very, very valuable skill to have. So he, he does a, a show called Real Future. You can watch it on the Fusion.net website. It's a documentary about technology and society. In this most recent episode, he talks about how he went to two white hat hackers and said, hack me. Now, the two different companies use two different techniques. The first uses social engineering. Almost impossible to fight social engineering. Um, because they're using humans, not software. So you can have Windows Defender and malware bytes and every other antivirus in your system doesn't help. So what they did, first they started by compiling a dossier. They got all the public information they could. His address, his employer, social media accounts. All the stuff that was on public and public as as much of your people you know your people know your Twitter handle and they may know your email. Then they called Time Warner and Comcast Cable, pretending to be his girlfriend to see if he had an account. He didn't. Then they called his local utility company. He, he said to see if they have an account. He said I do, but it's not under my name. They found my social security number on a special purpose search engine, and then. The attack worked. He saw that he that he had ordered a hoverboard scooter from Alibaba. So he wrote a fake email from Alibaba, a phishing email, that led to a link where he had to confirm his mailing address for customs. Hey, I ordered something from a Chinese company. I guess that makes sense. He filled it out. He fell for it. Then one of the social engineering hackers, Jessica Clark called his cell phone company, pretended to be his non-existent wife, asked for access to his account. To make the act more convincing, she found a YouTube video of a crying baby and played it in the background while spinning an elaborate sob story about how I was out of the country on business and how if she could just get into the account, she could get the information she needed to apply for a loan. You can watch it on video. It worked, and he was owned. Social engineered. That's just one of two hacks. I'll tell you about the other one when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Crying baby in the background. 
The problem with so, is customer service reps want to be helpful. Customer service. And they're not trained. They're not trained as they should be to thwart kinds of those kinds of attacks. Our show today brought to you by Epson. Oh, I love the EcoTank printers. Oh, they're such a good printers. Uh, I know you love the EcoTank printers, right? I mean, who's, what's not to love? The idea is you get this great printer. And, you know, one of the things people often complain about is, uh, you know, oh, now I got to go out and get the cartridges and right out, you run out in the middle of a job or they're so expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So Epson did something that some might think was kind of self-defeating because I'm sure they make a lot of money on those. They said, you know what? We're going to do the right thing for our users. We're going to do the eco tank. This is a printer that doesn't use ink cartridges. It's it comes with the ink in the box. In fact, quite a bit of ink in the box. Two years of ink in the box. That means you won't be buying new cartridges, more and more ink for two, for 8,500 color pages or 11,000 black pages. And when you do need to buy ink, it's very uh, affordable, low cost replacement bottles. Actually, if you get the big workstation version, because they have all sizes of these printers. Big one is at the bottom here. It'll do 20,000 pages. And for that, you replace the uh, ink with these ink packs. Also, ultra low cost. They just change the whole equation. Thank you, Epson. And by the way, these are these great all-in-one printers the, based on the Precision Core engine, which gives you 40 million drops of ink a second. Super crisp black and white text, vivid colors, automatic two-sided printing. I use that a lot to save paper. You were, that's Yeah, you're really saving on consumables. Uh, you can scan, you can fax if you want. Color copying. It will scan to the cloud. You can print from the cloud. You can print from your smartphone or tablet wirelessly. I mean, it's everything. It's everything you want. And with two years of ink in the box, it is a great deal. Epson.com slash Ecotank to learn more. Great printers. And now Epson has completely changed the equation in favor of you, the consumer. Thank you, Epson. Epson.com slash Ecotank. Epson. Exceed your vision. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. We were talking about this amazing article. It got started by our caller saying, well, I can't turn on Windows Defender. It's so important that your security is protected by you, not by any software. And it becomes very clear when you see a, an accomplished bad guy uh, hack you um, that no software is going to protect you. You just heard the social engineering side, if you were listening a moment ago. Um, that Now, no software will protect that. Some woman cries claiming to be your wife with a crying baby in the background. The phone company gave you up. Just said, anything you want. Whatever. What can I help you with? Oh, the baby's crying. Your husband's out of town. Here's the phone number. Here's the account. Go on. Go get it. Because they're customer service reps, right? CSR. Customer service. They're trying to give the customer service. In fact, they're giving the hacker service. So part two. Part two, he, uh, he goes to a software hacker. Now, this, is, this is, of course, ha requires greater skills. Most of hacking right now is social engineering combined with some limited software skills. Social engineering is easy. And unfortunately, we haven't trained our customer service reps to defend. Think about your company. If somebody called an employee and, and came up with a sob story, your employee is, is how, how well trained is your employee? Would they give up the network passwords? They might. So we don't think about this, but, but seriously, this is a really good and strong avenue that no software can protect against. He then went to a company called Phobos Group and a hacker named Dan Tentler. Again, white hack. These are guys who um, are not bad guys. He said, look, I have some conditions. <laughs> I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you hack me, <laughs> but, and I'm not going to give you additional information. I'm just, you got to hack me, but uh, you have to be able to reverse it and fix anything and you can't steal from me. <laughs> and Dan said, okay. <laughs> I think he said something uh, like after receiving this, go ahead and may God have mercy on you. <laughs> so uh, actually that was the, f the first hacker, the social engineering hacker. So uh, Tentler uh, 
started again with a phishing scheme. Notice that in both cases, email, the purporting to be from real sources, was the back door. So this is why it's very important, again, antivirus software won't protect you here, that you be aware of this and that you be alert to these. Uh, we get, I get phishing scams all the time. Almost fell for one last week. I think I mentioned it. I'll talk about it later. So he, uh, he found, um, Dan found uh, Kevin Roos's website. It's on Squarespace. Uh, he registered a domain name that was one letter away. Looked very close. Somebody tried to hack me, uh, my Twitter account, by sending me to a site that was not T-W-I-T-T-E-R, but T -double -V -I -T -T -E -R, which on a browser, if you're not looking real closely, looks exactly the same as Twitter.com. Two V's and a W, not very different. Dan Kevin says, I've received a lot of phishing scams over the years. This was the slickest one I've ever seen. It came, purported to come from Squarespace's security team asking me to go to a page and install a certificate to improve security. A lot of sites are doing this now. We're giving, we're putting certificates on the site for secure connections. Kevin said, this one fooled me. I clicked on it. Even though I promised myself I'd be extra careful knowing that hackers were targeting me. The certificate I installed, of course, wasn't really from my web host. It was malware he'd written to create a shell that allowed him to remotely log onto my computer and execute commands as if they were his own, essentially giving him control of my entire machine. Once he did that, he popped up a box that looked like it came from Macintosh OS X asking for administrator password. He gave it. Then he installed a keystroke logger that captured every letter I typed, used it to steal my login information for my password manager, one password. That mean he meant he had all of my passwords now, all of them. He found his drop cam credentials, used it to spy on my house through my own security system. He installed a program that snapped photos of me out of my webcam and took a screenshot of my laptop screen every two minutes and sent them to a server where he could collect and view them. He at one point sent a robotic voice to said, you look bored through his computer. <laughs> Imagine how scary that would be. You're sitting at your computer, minding your own business, and the computer says, you look bored. When he met with uh, Dan afterwards, he says, it's ridiculous, Dan said. I have control of your digital life in its entirety. I have all your credentials. I have all your access to your financial information, all your work information, all your personal information. I can pay people with your bank account or your Amex account. For all intents and purposes, I am you. That's what we call owned or pwned in hacker speak. He's owned. And he was prepared and ready but fell for a very effective scam. A little social engineering in that, right? He had to know some stuff about uh, Kevin and, and, and craft a what we call a spear phishing attack. M most phishing emails are a broad net. Those are not as effective, and those are the ones you get all the time, as ones aimed at you, targeting you. That's how they got into Sony, by the way, Sony Pictures Entertainment, we believe, targeted email that's more believable because it fits your life story and you expect it and you go, oh yeah, I've been expecting that. Oh yeah, that's from a friend. That's called spear phishing and it's very effective. And really the bottom line is if a hacker wants to attack you particularly, there's not much you can do about it. It's very difficult to prevent that. The, he said, the reason you shouldn't worry, Kevin, and others is because you're not a government official, a CEO, an intelligence officer, a celebrity. It's unlikely that an attacker would be interested in destroying your life. The principle is called privacy through obscurity. Anyone can theoretically be hacked by anyone with enough skill and time on their hands, but most of us just aren't interesting enough for hackers to care about it. He talked to uh, another skilled hacker uh, about this. Morgan Marcus Bohr, uh, former Googler and director of another security firm, First Look Media. Marcus made really, I think, of, or Morgan made a very, very good point. He said, do you worry about trained martial artists beating you up on the street? Mm, not much, responded Roos. But you're aware they do exist. You're aware that 
should one come up to you, you probably couldn't stop them from beating you up in the street, right? Their skills are far greater than yours. So we're all vulnerable all the time to a variety of things. You take normal precautions. You don't, you don't, <laughs> maybe you should carry a gun. I don't know if you're worried about martial artists beating you up. I, would that be sufficient? If they're really good, probably they just take the gun, shoot you. Is there any way to prevent yourself from being hacked? Probably not. You should take all reasonable precautions. Put Turn on two-factor authentication. All the things I talk about all the time. An antivirus, is that going to protect you? No, no, no. No. And it gives you a false sense of security. There, This is a strong argument, and I hope you'll watch it on Fusion.net. Kevin Roos, R-O-O-S-E. Uh, it's an episode uh, in uh, Episode 8 of Real Future, their documentary series. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I've been everywhere, man. He's been everywhere, man. He's traveled all around, man. He's Johnny Jet, our travel guy. Hey, Johnny, good to see you. I hope you're feeling better. Feeling much better than I was in the past few days. I've been very sick. Do not and, listen uh, to Leo Laporte's travel advice. That's the rule. <laughs> Johnny normally wipes everything down with Clorox wipes on every plane and every hotel room. Yeah, he was wiping down, what, the remote control. I said, Johnny, don't, what are you worried about? And, of course, he didn't, and he got sick. And it's my Big fault. Time. I take full responsibility. Uh, that's why you're the travel guy, not me. Yeah. Well, so. I had 103 temperature for Oy. about four or five days. I hope you're feeling better. And uh, I'm on antibiotic. But, you know, I was in D.C., and I needed to come back home to L.A., and, you know, you call the airline, and when I see them had a high temperature, I was like, can I change my ticket? And, of course, they're like, no, you'll have to pay, you know, buy a no, new ticket or, or you know, the fare difference, which is literally five to ten times with the price oh. I paid. I paid $145 oh. for a one-way ticket. And so they, they wanted about almost $1,000 to change it. So, I mean, people can't do that. So I, I really think the airlines need to – to change their policies. I know people were abusing it, which is why they changed it, you know, back to what it is now. But the one way around it is because I did have travel insurance. I could, I could have done it. And do you buy you know, travel insurance for every ticket you buy? I have a yearly policy. Oh. I, so full disclosure, Allianz is one of my sponsors, but they are the biggest. Now, how much? If I so I travel there. a lot, not as much as you, but uh, how, so you you play you pay uh, like a yearly thing, and yep. what does that cover? Everything you do. Yep. So, uh, I think it I think it cost me four hundred and forty dollars a year. I'm buying it. That's worth right, it. That's I right, paid for that one right ticket. There. Exactly. Because they would I think they would have paid for the hotel. They said because like, I called Allianz up and they said that you would just have to see a doctor within seventy two hours after after canceling. But wow. you, they said call the airline up, let them know that you're changing your ticket now, or whatever. Does that cover um, like a cruise? Because I always buy insurance for big trips, right? Right. Well, again, and it costs more to, than four hundred bucks. I might add. Well, you have to read the fine print uh, on from what it is. And so, and I was with Natalie, so it wouldn't cover Natalie because she doesn't right. have that policy. I should better get it. But um, you know, it's if it's for like cancel any time, then you can do it. Especially for like Zika virus, like everyone's worried about Zika, and you know, people who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant and things like that. You know, most most airlines won't let you cancel because of that, or some <sighs> will, but. <sighs> Or actually, most travel insurance policies won't let you cancel unless what? you have cancel for any time. Wow. So always read the fine print no matter what it is. Yeah. But anyway. Um, How come you didn't use your travel insurance? Because, you know, what? I needed to be in home in L.A. And what I did is I – and there was – all the seats were all – I would have sat in the middle seat for the next couple of days. And, you know, instead of getting upgraded for free up in first class. So, so I, I was like, I you know, noticed you, you, you wore a face mask, which was very – considerate of you because you don't want other people to get sick and that's my tip is yeah. to, you know always carry a mask with you if you're sick or if someone else is sick next to you so you know i put the mask on when i got to the airport everyone looks at you or you feel like people are looking at you but you gotta you know, realize who cares like in japan everyone does it when people are sick in japan they put a mask on they're considerate so and i learned that so that's important them. a lot of times i see people with masks they're not trying not to get sick they're sick and they're trying not to infect other people Usually. Usually, I mean, I can't, I, I can't tell. For I wouldn't sure. want to walk around all the time with a mask on. No, no, no. If, if only the sickies would wear masks, then we'd be fine. And that's what they do usually. Yeah. And wash your hands a lot. 
Exactly. And, especially, and and if you're a traveler, you always want to wash your hands yeah. because that's you're not going to get sick from the air because the air the filters on the planes are really they're hospital grade safe. I mean, the way you're going to get sick is when someone touches something and they're sick and then you put your finger in your mouth or your eye or your nose or whatever. So anyway, that's where you got to be careful. But um, enough with that. I want to give you a, a website, an app and, and uh, stuff like that. So, you know, I had an early morning flight. So there's a service called Wake Up Dialer. Have you heard of this one? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you can get the hotel to do this usually. You can, but if you're if you're renting a if you're renting an Airbnb oh, yeah. or, who's gonna, or, or who you gonna, who's going to call you? Yeah. Or even at your own home and you you know, you have an early morning flight, you don't know if your uh, phone's going to wake you up or your alarm clock. And I, I always get worried about that. So anyway, it's free service. You can just put in your number. I just did it just now just to test it. And it's pretty funny. You get a um, greeting voice by this um, English actor named Stephen Fry. Oh, and, I love and, Stephen Fry. And it's pretty funny. I'm not going to tell you what he says. but um, Oh, my gosh. They have Stephen it, Fry doing it? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and that's it's, awesome. And it's, it's a great peace of mind. I mean, because honestly, you know how many times I've had early morning flights and I stay up the whole night because I'm worried that I'm going to miss it? Because, you know, sometimes I've had my phone change time zones on me in the middle of the night and and there's no phone, there's no alarm clock in the place I'm in. So anyway, this is just a nice peace of mind. I also used to have, you know, my wife say, can you please call me at this number and just wake me up? But this is a good alternative. Wakeupdialer.com. Wakeupdialer.com. And it's free. Oh, I, yeah. And I just I just did it on the website, but they have an app as well. That is nice. All right, and it's and it's a funny wake up call. See, that's the thing I don't like about wake up wake up calls, is uh, it's kind of it's nice if it's automated. To be honest, for with sure. you. I don't want to talk to somebody first thing in the morning. With, 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 wakey wakey, without a doubt. Come on, I'm gonna so, play it. I gotta play it for you. I gotta do it. It's radio, okay. man. Listen, I'm so sorry to disturb you, but it appears to be morning. <laughs> Very inconvenient. Uh. I agree. I believe it is the rotation of the Earth that is to blame. You know what? There was that's, a clock that had Stephen Fry doing it. There's a variety of them. And that's I think the that they I just have. took the ones from the clock. So it's different every time. I guess so. Wakey, I just did wakey. It 10 minutes ago. Sounds like Jeeves. Really? You just got woken up? Oh, poor Johnny. Well, wow, I feel you're like I woke up. Feel, you're making me feel terrible. <laughs> All right. I'm get, getting better. So and I got an app for you, too. This is for people who are... In L.A. or going to L.A., actually, the mayor had a, a conference about it a couple weeks ago, Go L.A. app. And I think they're also doing one on Denver soon. But it'd be cool if every city did something like this. And what it does is it will tell you the quickest way to go from you know point A to point B, but it will give you all the options. So this one does you know, you know know your car, walk, bike, all, or share, like zip car or bike share or ride hailing, lift. Actually, Uber used to be in it, but they're not in it anymore. So they pulled out, which is oh, kind of a bummer. Oh, that's annoying. So but it's kind of like City Mapper. Exactly. Yeah. But it's also, per it, city. Per city. Yeah. And and there's and and I also have parking options, which City Mapper I do not think I have. So you can that's just nice. hit park park whiz, and um, and also obviously all the um, trains, buses, subways, and sadly to say that you know I'm a huge public transportation fan, but I've never taken public transportation in Los Angeles. Which is, um, <laughs> I think you're not alone. <laughs> no, I, I see here. those cars riding around empty all the time. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I feel like I really should, but I just, you know, something about LA's public transportation doesn't do it for me. Yeah. Go LA <sighs> app. And there's a web version as well as uh, Android there and is. iOS versions, and it's free. And on the app, you know, when you, when you, when you log on, they're going to ask you to register. You don't need to register, just hit skip. And then and it takes 20 seconds. You do not need to register. That is awesome. Johnny, I hope that's chicken soup. It's, it's tea. All right. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling British today. I hope you have some chicken soup somewhere <laughs> in there. You know, and I, I did. I, 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 had, I had some last night. I'm yeah. feeling much better. Good. But Good. And never listen to that Leo. His travel yeah, that, advice Yeah, that Leo stinks. guy, man. <laughs> I'm bringing Clorox wipes with me everywhere from, <laughs> from now on. <laughs> I'm hosing everything down. I think everyone has, or a lot of people have it. I'm what, turning on a TV and I see all the different commentators are sick. Yeah, it's just one of those times. And, and, yeah. I, and I had a flu shot, and they said this year the flu shot was one of the best um, matches. Really? So, yeah. Isn't that funny? I, you know, I didn't get one. I usually do, and I forgot. My wife did. She got the flu. So. 
Well, you never one know. of my doctors says it's actually better to get a, the flu shot every other year. Ah, well, I got it last year. So you kind of like build some immunity. You want a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get it every year. JohnnyJet.com. You know. Follow him on Twitter at JohnnyJet, Instagram, and, of course, his website, free travel newsletters and more. Johnny Jet, feel better. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 88, 88. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Interesting, my 24-year-old uh, daughter has had it with Facebook. She just deleted her account. I thought that was... A, do you think that'll be a... Is that a new trend, I wonder? She said, I don't really... You know what? The, the um, tipping point for her was one of the professors... She says in, a col in college, one of the professors that she didn't really know asked to be her buddy. And, and she felt awkward about the whole thing. And she said, you know, I don't even like being in this situation. So I'm just going to get rid of the thing. Hmm, interesting. Have we had enough social media to last a lifetime? Stephen Fry, the guy who did that talking alarm clock that we were just playing for Johnny Jet, recently quit Twitter. <laughs> Saying it just, it's too, he can't, he doesn't like waking up and seeing the comments you know, because, you know, I, I'm sympathetic. There's a lot of, it's very easy on Twitter to do drive-by attacks on people because you're anonymous. Um, but there's also very positive, wonderful stuff. And there's a lot of great conversations, too. So while I was the, I, by the way, should point out, I was the very first person to quit Twitter <laughs> back in 2007 when it was four months old. <laughs> and I came back a couple of months later. I quit Facebook. Back before it was all the rage, some years ago, and I came back. I think in the, in the long run, I of course, I have to, right? That's part of my job. But I kind of like the interaction, and you just learn to tune out the noise and focus on the interesting stuff. And there's tools that will let you do that uh, on both sites. 8888-ASK-LEO, uh, that's the phone number. Bob is in Calabasas, California, our next caller. Hi, Bob. <clears throat> Hi, Leo. Uh, I have a question. It's basically a security issue. I want to write a Word document using Windows 7 and Office 2013, which contains all my important info, so I can print it out and attach it to my last will and testament. <clears throat> oh, that's a good idea. That's so a good idea. I want idea. to avoid any online access to this file. So when I write the file, I'll have my Internet router turned off, and I'll write to a USB flash drive. And when I'm finished, I'll unplug the flash drive, shut down my computer. Question is, is there some way that the info got stored on my regular hard drive? So when I turn uh, the router back on and power up my computer, it would be available to a hacker. Yeah. Example, this I is why security is hard. You, you've, uh, you've done some thought experiments about how this would, you know, could be compromised. None of which are valid or useful. Stop. Stop. Because I could think of already three ways that somebody could get that information. So the problem is we're not security experts. And it is deucedly hard for somebody who doesn't really, you know, have the expertise to think of defenses. And doing it yourself is always a bad idea. Now, you, <laughs> it's that same question I posed earlier. You, you can't defend against a martial artist walking down the street and just beating the heck out of you <laughs> for no reason. Uh, so Ed, as, as important as this information is to you, it's probably not as important to anybody else. So, so to some degree, you're protected through obscurity, like security through obscurity. But I understand you don't want to do that. You would be much better off using an existing security tool than inventing your own. Because inventing your own is destined to failure. For instance, it doesn't matter if you're online. If there's a keystroke logger on your system right now, it will log it. And whenever you go back online, it'll send all the information, including the entire document, out to the bad guy. Done. It didn't matter that you turned the machine off or disconnected the Internet during the time you were doing it. If, if you're compromised now, you're out of luck. If you're not compromised now, it doesn't. you don't need to do all those things. <laughs> Nobody's got access to your hard drive. So it's a very difficult thing to solve. 
What I would suggest doing, there are good methods for doing this that don't require what you're doing. For instance, do you use a password manager right now? No, I've heard you talk about that, but it sounds more complicated than, than it was worth. So I thought my simple method would be safe. Yeah, right. Uh, again, we're not security experts, so it's probably a bad idea to design our own security. So a password manager, a good one, is well designed by, by people who know security. By the way, not all of them are, so I'll tell you which ones are safe to use. Um, and provide a mechanism for sharing your passwords on your death. Uh, that's what I do. So I use a program called LastPass, well designed by a guy named Joe Segrist, who is a security expert and has thought all of this stuff out very carefully. Uh, by using LastPass to generate and save passwords for websites, you need to only remember one password. That's your master password. And if you keep that in your head or you write it down somewhere that's safe, like that Word document, that's, that's protecting you against anybody getting your information. LastPass has a wonderful feature they just recently added, an emergency contact feature. And what that is, is you can designate a spouse or a trusted a lawyer, whoever you trust, a, a, a child. In my case, I use my wife. And I gave it her email address. If something should happen to me, she can request access to my vault. Now, LastPass, they thought about this a little bit. And they said, okay, but what will happen if she does is you will get an email saying, Lisa's asked for access to your vault. Do you want to grant it? If you don't respond, and then you set the amount of time, if you're dead, you're not going to respond, right? So you can say, if I don't respond to that in a day or two or five or a week, then give her access. So that's kind of a little dead man switch you can add to that. This is a good system. Now, if somebody has a keystroke logger on your computer now, doesn't matter. They're going to log all your passwords and keys no matter what. It, remember our, our story about Kevin Roos, who uses a very good password vault called 1Password. It is also one I recommend. 1Password has an advantage over LastPass. You never store, or you don't have to store, your password vault online. You could store it somewhere private, nobody has access to. And even if they got it, it's fully encrypted with strong encryption, so they can't get into it. Unless you have a dumb password like monkey123. Uh, but even then, they'd have to attack you specifically as opposed to LastPass, where all they have to do is get into the LastPass vault. At least, you know, by doing that, they'll get everybody's, and then they can find ones with bad passwords. So one password has that advantage. Um, I don't know if it has the sharing feature. That's something that LastPass just added. It's the first one I've seen. I really like that idea. But again, all bets are off if you've been compromised already. The Microsoft yeah. Word document is... N not ideal. I mean, I, frankly, if you wrote it in a notebook and locked the notebook in a safety deposit box, that would be safer. Wrote it by hand in a notebook? Either? Yeah, because then there's no, there's so not been... It. See, then I can't edit it easily. I, I like the fact that it's on a computer so I can change it. Yeah, so there's a, there's a scale, there's a balance between safety and security and convenience. And the ultimate security requires some inconvenience, like, for instance... I've got it written in a notebook that I have to go to my safety deposit box to get. Uh, the more convenient would be something on your computer. But if you're going to do that, and I understand that's what I do because I choose more convenience, um, do something, though, that is, that is done by security experts and they've thought out the issues. And, uh, and rather, you know, what you described sounds fine to me, but... Again, I'm not. A, I'm not the. Uh, I probably know more about security than you do, but I'm not a security expert by any means. So, and I can think of attacks against what you just described, but uh, I can also think about attacks against LastPass. A keystroke logger is very hard to get around. That's, by the way, what that bad guy got on Kevin Roos's computer. He sent him an email that was very believable, and Kevin believed it and ran it and did it and it installed a keystroke logger, and, that, and then it was over. Because even if you've disconnected from the internet during that time, the keystroke logger is running the whole time and just stores up all the things you type until such time as you get back on the internet. Furthermore, Word spreads files around, temporary files and so forth. And even if you erase those files, erasing does not erase data as we know, right? It just changes the file name and says you can reuse this. So somebody with access to your hard drive could get it. 
you can do a secure erase, but there's still slack space, swap space where that data may live, some or all. The problem is if somebody has physical access to your system, all bets are off. It's very hard to protect yourself. So there's, it, there's levels of security. Can you reasonably assume that nobody, has, nobody malicious has physical access to your system? If you can, then what you describe might be okay. Can you say, I, I'm pretty sure I don't have a keystroke logger. Nobody has physical access. Okay, then what you just described sounds fine. Make sure you use a secure delete. I don't want people to be paranoid either. That's the trick, right? We have to live our lives. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's snack time, my favorite time of the day. Woohoo! Where's my snacks? Did you guys eat my nature box? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Nature box snacks are so good. That was easy. All I have to do is whine. So they come in the box. It's great. You get to pick ahead of time. They have more than 100 snacks. And the thing about NatureBox snacks is they're all nutritionist designed to be healthy. No GMOs. Uh, you can get no sugar added if you want. That's what I usually do. Do um, You have choices between savory, sweet, salty, and tart. You can get no GMOs. You looking at snacks? Okay, now you tell me which one you want. This is always a favorite. Sarah Lane used to, used to eat these all. We'd get the box and they'd be gone. Strawberry Greek yogurt pretzels. Love those. But don't choose yet because there's more. How about this one? Garlic plantains. Plantain chips with garlic. Oh, they're crispy. They're delicious. They're salty. No? No? All right. All right. Southern barbecue sunflower kernels. Sunflower seeds already out of the thing, right? You don't have to go. And they are barbecue flavored. Ooh, nice. How about golden apple tea biscuits? What? Yeah, I got to try those. Sriracha roasted cashews. Oh, this is my favorite. In fact, somebody has already opened these. Sticks and stones. Roasted nuts with sesame sticks. I love these. Salt and pepper pistachios, anyone? So here's the deal. You choose. You fill out your snack profile. You'll get recommendations based on previous preferences. And then they deliver them to you every month. Your first box, 50% off right now when you go to naturebox.com slash twit. Mmm. So good. Oh, and they're all resealable. See, that's what I like. So, because I'm on a diet, can't have too many sesame sticks. So I had a nice taste. It was delicious. Seal that right up. Boom. That's going to be good and fresh for next time. Naturebox.com slash twit. Save 50% right now. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet. Home theater, digital photography, smart watches, and of course, smartphones too. This was a big week for smartphones uh, in Barcelona, Spain. The Mobile World Congress uh, just wrapped up, and all of the phone companies except Apple announced new phones, lots of new phones. I'm very excited. I can't wait to see the new Galaxy uh, S7. Samsung showed that off the S7 and the F7 Edge. Uh, it's, I really like the S6, and this new one has a bigger battery. Finally, uh, they brought finally. They, last year they took out the SD card. They've brought the SD card back. Um, waterproofing is back. Big battery in the S7 Edge, uh, which I think every Android phone needs a big battery. It's rare to see them last all day, and I, you know I need it to last 16 hours. That's what I want. I want to get up 7 a.m., unplug the phone, and uh, not plug it in again until I go to bed at 11. That's not too much to ask, is it? 16 hours. Uh, I don't care if it's at 20% or 10% by 11 p.m., but but something like that. And uh, in normal use, like I'm not just leaving it off, but like I'm using it. A couple hours, a couple of three hours of on-screen time. Some phones can do that, used to be to do that. The iPhone 6S Plus can absolutely do that. It gets through the day no problem you know your experience will vary because for one thing phones do very badly where there's weak cell signals they're always hunting for cell signals that kills battery fast so your mileage may vary i just uh, you know i i think that that's not too much to ask i don't want to have to charge it at dinner <laughs> i want it to get through the day i know some people who have two phones one a, a day phone and a night phone that's not a good solution <laughs> You really need to have one phone that gets through the day. 
So I'll, uh, I ordered the S7 uh, Edge. Uh, all the carriers uh, put it on pre-order, and I ordered it, and I should have it in a couple of weeks, and I'll let you know. LG announced their new G5. I'm not sure when that will be available, but that looks awfully good, too. Also, a removable battery on that one, and uh, an expansion slot that allows you to do some additional stuff. They have a camera expansion slot and a, a high-fidelity sound expansion slot. It should be interesting to see how that takes off. A lot of people loved their the successor to the G5. The G4 was a very good phone last year. I have a phone that's kind of a, at least until the S7 comes, this is going to be my phone. And it's kind of a offbeat choice. This from, comes from a company that was a little Kickstarter project uh, called Nextbit. They were founded by uh, one of the designers of one of my favorite phones uh, from years gone by, the HTC One. Uh, he and two guys from Google Android, including one of the top developers at Android, uh, left to form their own company, Nextbit. They raised capital from venture capitalists, and then they went to Kickstarter and raised a few million more. I got in on the Kickstarter early for the, what they call the Robin. The Robin just arrived this week. And you could tell that the company is run by a designer because it is a designer phone. And I don't mean flashy at all. I mean kind of aesthetically very pleasing. There were two colors. There's a midnight blue, and I got the mint, which really I think of as robin's egg blue since the phone is called the robin. It kind of looks like a robin's egg blue. Soft plastic. It's not metal. The soft finished plastic. It's It's got hard square edges. I kind of like it. And they've did some things that I, I agree with. They have, like the HTC One, front-facing speakers. That gives you good audio. Not super loud, but at least good audio. Separate amplifiers for both speaker. Uh, the fingerprint reader is interesting. You, by the way, I'm not going to buy a phone from now on that doesn't have a fingerprint reader. That is really a great convenience in unlocking the phone. Theirs is on the on-off switch. And I kind of like that because it means it's a simple, it's one touch to turn it on and then unlock it. So it's a very natural feeling. Perhaps not as, uh, maybe not quite as useful as the uh, Google Nexus phones, which have a fingerprint reader on the back. That's what LG is going to do, too. That's very natural as you're holding the phone to put your finger on the fingerprint reader. But it's pretty close. And I do find it better than Samsung's choice, which is to have it on the physical home button at the bottom of the screen. You have to touch that. That's a little bit more a little bit more ungainly. The other thing I love about uh, the Robin, besides the design, uh, is it's pretty pure uh, Android. I think nowadays that's important. With, with one weird exception, it, it only comes in one size, 32 gigabytes of storage. Uh, and there's no SD card. But what it does also come with is 100 gigabytes of online storage. And if your phone gets low on storage, it will upload not just pictures and data, but actually apps that you don't use very often. It'll upload them to the cloud. And the icon will get grayed out when it's not on the phone. And then when you hit that icon to run that application, it'll take a, a little while as it re-downloads it from the cloud. <laughs> I think that's kind of silly. I, I, I guess they needed something to differentiate them. And for some people, this is a problem. Although nowadays with Google Photos and other solutions, I, I don't worry about filling my phone up with pictures anymore. Google Photos will upload those pictures and delete them. Uh, so I have access to them in the Google Photos app, but I don't have to worry about using storage. Um, so that's less important than it used to be. But I, they needed some secret sauce. Um, the other thing I like is they chose to do a relatively for nowadays low res screen it's only a 1080p screen now at, at a at, for a phone like this which is 5.1 inches that's plenty of resolution but it helps a lot with battery life and yes i've been getting 18 hours i'm very happy i can get through the day on this 16 hours um which makes me very happy this is and it's 400 dollars unlocked available for all the major carriers in the u.s and probably around the world too uh, the next bit, Robin. It's kind of a, you know what? It's not going to be a huge seller. You're probably not going to see a lot of them in the wild. You may not even hear about it after after this review, but I've been very happy with it. And I, I, you could tell a designer had something to do with it. Type-C connector. Just feels kind of nice in the hand. It's a nice phone. And for 400 bucks, I mean, that's about not quite half what the Samsung Galaxy S7 is, oh, and a, de a decent uh, uh, camera. I think it's a, is it 16 megapixels? I can't remember. 13 megapixels. Decent camera uh, with a dual color flash. You know, pretty much that's kind of the standard now. 
The S7, on the other hand, might be an amazing camera. I can't wait to get that because uh, they've they've made it a very low light camera, 12 megapixels, which means big, big, big dots. That means more light comes in, and a very fast lens, an f 1.7 lens which is the fastest on a phone out there that's going to be a beast but at seven or eight hundred bucks it's going to be an expensive beast this would be a phone for most people most people would be very happy with the next bit robin uh i just i like the feel of it and it's not doesn't look like any other phone out there it's kind of interesting uh but i will probably in the next couple of weeks have an s7 g5 when it comes out it's uh there's good phones out there and yes apple's going to announce a new phone in about two weeks the 5SE, which should be a low-cost iPhone designed uh, for people who don't need the latest and the greatest. And want a sm most, most importantly, want a smaller screen. I think they're going to do a four-inch screen. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo. It really has come down to Apple and Samsung, though, hasn't it? That's the war. And mostly Apple in the high end. In the low end, there are lots of great choices. Even, even Microsoft uh, is still in the hunt when you get to phones under a few hundred bucks. Moto X, lots of good choices out there. 8888 asks, Leo Dave is asking in the chat room, I wonder if Leo knows how many phones he's bought in his life. <sighs> I didn't want to think about it. And I do buy these. I don't like to do review units because I like to really exp you know, use them and experience them. And I don't like public relations people breathing down my neck either. So I do tend to buy these. Um, I'll put it this way. I have five separate phone lines, cell phone lines, two with AT&T, two with T-Mobile, one with Google Fi. And at all, any given time, I have five phones. I have the five, what I consider the five latest best phones out there. <laughs> and then hundreds. I'm leaving a trail of hundreds behind me. But you know what? The people who work for me love it. Because they get new phones a lot. <laughs> 8888, ask Leo. As long as you like Android. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll go back to the phones. Speaking of phones and your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. Let's talk high tech. Steve in Detroit, you're next. Hi, Steve. Thanks for hanging on. Leo Laporte here. Uh, hello. How are you, Leo? I'm well, Steve. How are you? I'm just doing okay. Uh, it's a really nice day in Detroit. Um, I, I was mean to ask you because I'm in a market uh, looking for an HD TV. I'm thinking of all the specs and all that. And I've been debating whether or not I should get one of those smart TVs or a set top box uh, 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 like a Roku 2 or an Apple TV. And the reason why I ask, because I'm a little nervous about those smart TV. Uh, inside the ADTV because of a lot of privacy concerns that's been going around. So what would I recommend, an HDTV with Smart TV or one of those top boxes? Well, yeah, I don't in, – in most cases, the Smart TV software is terrible. So even though it's hard – be honest with you, it's hard to find a TV that isn't a Smart TV unless it's very low end. They all want their own software in there. Samsung's Smart TV software is awful. Oh. Uh, uh, Vizio's is not bad. I, I think Vizio's done an all right job. But in almost every case, even though I have a smart TV with Netflix and Amazon and stuff, um, I, I end up using the Roku or the Apple TV or both um, because I just, uh, you know, or TiVo. I just like those better. But you're going to be hard-pressed to find a decent high-end uh, TV that doesn't have smart. All smart means is you can connect this TV to the Internet and then it has applications on it that allow you to watch Netflix, Amazon streaming, Hulu. Um, none of them, by the way, will do Apple. There is no smart TV that supports iTunes out of the box, to my knowledge. I might be wrong, but I don't know of any. Uh, you have to buy an Apple TV to do that anyway. So okay. if you want to buy stuff on iTunes and watch stuff on iTunes, you're going to need an Apple TV. And you're going to end up using it for almost everything. Okay. So, I, you know, I wouldn't choose the TV based on whether or not it has smart features. Now, the privacy concern that some people have raised, there's a couple of issues. Samsung really scared people because they put out a uh, terms of service on some of their TVs. Some of their TVs have voice activation. You could talk to the TV. And they said it is listening all the time. Be aware in their 
notes in the terms of service, it is listening all the time. And that scared the heck out of people. Everything that you have that you could talk to right now, whether it's Google or Siri, Amazon's Echo, your smart TV, your Microsoft Xbox One with Connect, all of those are listening all the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to wake them up. I can't find the answer to the question I heard. As you can see, I have an Amazon Echo, and it's responding to my... I, I, I wasn't talking to you. They're always listening. But what are they doing when they're, quote, listening? We have to be careful about anthropomorphizing machinery. Because when a human's listening, it's understanding. This thing is not sending it back to the home office. None of the devices I have that can be woken up by my voice are sending all the audio back to Samsung or Amazon or Apple or Google. That would be prohibitively expensive and dumb. What they do is they have a pattern matcher built into their software that's looking for their wake-up phrase. And when it matches, they, they are in a, you know, you could say they're listening all the time. That's what Samsung meant. Like, they're always picking up the sound, but they're not doing anything with it. They're not understanding it. They're not sending it back to Samsung. They're just looking for their magic word. Now, once they hear the magic word, then because they don't have enough processing power to understand what you're saying, what you say gets sent back to those offices. So that's where those end user license agreements are warning you. Look, when, you, when you're talking to us, it's always on unless you turn it off. It's always, quote, listening. But understand, that merely means looking for a pattern in the waveforms. And then when, you, when, it, when it matches that, it will do as my... Amazon just did. My Echo just did. It'll wake up and say, "What? I don't. What? I was." So it did send some back to Amazon, right? And you can see, by the way, with the Alexa, with uh, Google Now, you can't do this with Siri or uh, Microsoft, but you can with Google and with uh, Amazon. See what it heard. I'm um, no. I no no. Cancel. Not talking to you. <laughs> you could see what it heard. And in fact, the one of the nice features of the Amazon of the Echo, I gotta stop saying Amazon. That's her. That's her trigger phrase. Is you can say no, that wasn't what I said, or that was what I said. You can give it feedback in the application. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Now there are some maybe privacy concerns in the sense that TVs do watch what channels you watch, and send it back, uh, and that information is very valuable to a TV company because, well, everybody wants to know what you're watching. <laughs> Uh, I don't really care, um, but if you didn't want that, then you would really look for a TV that you could disable that feature. I wish companies would sell their best screens as just monitors. I don't want any other complexity in there. I will handle what signals you get. I will use the set-top box and everything. I will control that myself. Just be a great monitor, but nobody makes that. Unfortunately, I wish they, I wish they would. <sighs> Maybe I shouldn't have an, an an echo in here during the radio show. <laughs> Maybe that's a bad idea. I just can't say the A word anymore. <laughs> so um, as for what to look for, there is now a standard called UHD Premium that you probably, since you're in the good have the good fortune of being buying at the new cycle of TVs. Uh, you might want to look at the new standard from the UHD Alliance. They're calling it Ultra HD Premium. If you get a set that is labeled that way, and all the new 2016 sets from the big manufacturers should be, it'll be 4K. It'll support uh, the new Blu-ray players that are coming out with 4K support. You'll definitely want that. It'll have the high dynamic range, which will make the uh, darks darker, the brights brighter. that will look more realistic. It'll have the color range. We call it gamut, uh, the higher color gamut to give you more realistic colors. All in all, it should be a better television. Uh, so if you are looking for a spec, that would be the one. But anything that's going to be Ultra HD Premium is for sure going to have smart TV built in. You know what really bugs me? My Samsung, which I spent a lot of money on, puts ads on the screen even when I'm watching TV. It's like, don't do that. Turn that off. I wish they would just give me a dumb monitor. Anybody have an idea for a dumb monitor, Ultra HD, UHD premium monitor? I would really be interested in that because that's all I want, and that's what you should get. Then you don't have to worry about it phoning home. Of course, your set-top box is phoning home, but 
Anything you have that goes online is phoning home <laughs> in some way or other. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Hey, yeah, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Good time to be buying TVs. The 2016 models are coming out now. In fact, when we uh, talk to Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guru, next week, I'll, uh, I'll ask him about that. He did mention that 3D TV is finally dead. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to exult. I'm not going to say I told you so. But uh, I mean, and by the way, that was another example of a feature I didn't want that I got just because all the high end TVs had them. Both my TVs have, all, have classes that I never use. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your call right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And Michael. From Oxnard. Hi, Michael. Leo Laporte here. Hey, Leo. Good to talk to you. Nice to call. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for calling. Listen, um, I'm going to be making a purchase. I'm visually impaired. Okay. And I'm looking at some Apple products. That's what people are suggesting, like the iPhone and maybe a laptop. So you don't have either right now. And I've never used an Apple product, so oh. I'm kind of new to it. But um, well, let me ask you, what accessibility software you use? Are you using uh, Jaws or? Well, I, I've used JAWS, and that's, I'm great that you asked that because um, I heard that the Apple VoiceOver is good. It just said there's not a lot of support for it. Maybe it's through the Apple Store or something like that. Yeah, and I'm not expert on this. Uh, this would be one to ask either friends who are using them because, you know, I can look at accessibility products and features, but I don't know whether whether it suits or not. Maybe we should ask Amazon. Yeah, ask ask Amazon. <laughs> Oops, quiet. No, no, you made me do that. <laughs> um, by the way, I would think that would be great for a blind user because uh, there's no text, no, you're just talking to her, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know how uh, functionality with the different programs or that, but I'm going to check it out. It's fairly limited. I mean, it's yeah, I this is early been. days on it. So um, I don't think you'll have, I think... The the thing is, I don't know if VoiceOver is as full and complete a screen reader as something like JAWS would be. I just don't right. know. And for that, you're going to need to ask some experts in and an adaptive technology, assistive technology. Because I what about with the with the Apple the Apple laptops like the Air? I heard you talk about the Air or the the Mac or the uh, Pro. Um, in terms of because obviously I don't need a, uh, a screen because I can't see. So what am I sacrificing if I go smaller or I, I don't get Yeah, you don't care about the screen at all. Right. Um, the only difference then between the – one of the reasons the Air isn't as good a choice is it's not retina. So for people okay. who care about the screen, the Pro or the, the thinner, lighter MacBook is a very good choice. I love the MacBook. But like the Air, you make sacrifices in performance – in fact, much more than the Air because it's only a Core M processor. And connectivity. The Air has USB ports and SD card reader ports. and, and uh, the Pro. So I, would need to, I would need a wireless connection like you were talking about the C port. The Type-C just... port is great. You can buy a dock. I just uh, found a really excellent $50 dock that allows you to power it. It has two USB 3 ports as well as a SD card reader and micro SD card reader all built into just one little plug-in thing so i don't i'm not, i like type c um if you needed to use additional connectors all the time if you had for instance a braille keyboard that had to be plugged right. in via usb then a pro or an air would be a better choice than the macbook okay that's actually a great i can, I can uh, look yeah. into that so. yeah and the mac but the, but i think as far as your question the macbook air is probably a better choice for you it's lighter it's thinner and the only real downside to the air is it's not quite as fast. You can get higher end processors and so forth in the pro. It's the screen. The screen is the biggest thing, right? Right. And you could get an 11 inch, you could get the smallest uh, air and have a very light portable the only, device. The only problem I was thinking about that is the keyboard, like, because it, it's a smaller unit, it's gonna, my fingers are kind of big, so it kind of. No, the keyboard's the, keyboard. the same. Keyboard's the same it's size. The same size? Yep. Oh, is it? Okay, great, great. All right, I will, I will. Thanks for that. Yeah, and I'm sorry I don't know much. I'll tell you what, everybody I know, we have many blind listeners, says the iPhone is the king of accessibility for smartphones. There's nobody as good.
Right, right. Exactly with the apps. Exactly. That's yeah. I think for. there's no question in my mind that you should have an iPhone. Now, you mentioned that uh, uh, Apple's coming out with a new phone, the 5... 5SE. Yeah. <laughs> this is interesting because it's just a smaller screen. So, again, you don't care. Uh, but it has... Functionality? I, I thought well, we think, you know, this is all rumor. Apple doesn't pre-announce, so we'll know on March 15th when Apple has its event. But I think we could say pretty for with some certainty that it, it is going to be the same processor... And the same capabilities as in the current iPhone 6S Plus. It's not a slower phone. It just has a smaller screen. It's aimed at a segment of the audience that doesn't want the larger screen. That's all. And that's right. you. Exactly. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. Very good. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for the call. Thanks for listening. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. Um, Larry in uh, Battle Mountain, Nevada. Hey, Larry. Hey, Leo. Hi. Uh Thanks for taking my call. I'm a long-time listener I'm, since I got Windows 95 and got the blue screen at that. <laughs> that long? Yeah. That's yeah. nice. I've been doing it even longer than that. Hard to believe. It's more than 20 years. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, wow. I, uh, I, I got a wireless network, and I'm, I'm thinking about upgrading to a power line network adapter. With I have been very happy with these. You know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, they weren't super reliable. Now, thanks to the Powerline uh, uh, Alliance, they've, I think they're quite reliable. They won't be as fast as a direct Ethernet connection, but it's a lot easier than stringing cable. Yeah, that's um, what I'm trying to Think about it as about half as fast as your Ethernet. But, you know, it's certainly as fast as, as your Internet. So, for instance, we have uh, uh, the routers in the living room, but way off to the side, we've got a gym way far away. We weren't getting good wireless access. Well, night. That's I went to TP-Link, which is a Chinese company. They make nice little ones. I got a TP-Link base unit. You plug that into the wall. The router goes into it. And then the remote unit is Wi-Fi. Plugged it into the wall in the gym. It has hard wire, but it also has Wi-Fi. It gets its signal through the power lines. Works great. Yeah, that's what I've been Very working. happy with it. Just, just don't have the expectation you'll get your full throughput. I'm getting like yeah. 10 megabits instead of 20 right. or 30. But big deal. Now they got. I looked up their internet on some of them. They say non pass through or pass through. Is there a difference? Pass through. Yeah, I'm not sure what that. I don't know. I don't. Oh, some of them are probably doing routing. Some of them aren't. So you, you may not need routing, for instance. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, because you got a router at the other end. Our show today brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Thank you, ZipRecruiter, for sponsoring the podcast. I appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate your service because it's great for anybody who's in the, you know, uh, enviable, unenviable, unenviable position of doing hiring. Well, it's both. The, pr you, when you, the people you hire make your company. A company is really just, it's made of people. So the right hire makes a huge difference, can really improve your company. The wrong hire... Well, I'm gonna take it the other direction. ZipRecruiter makes it easy to hire the right person fast without a big pain in your behind, in your tuchus. So let me go to uh, ZipRecruiter.com slash tech guy and show you. The idea is with ZipRecruiter, you post once and then they put your post everywhere. 100 plus job boards, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Craigslist, everywhere. So the most people see it. 100 plus job boards. And then all those, oh, and by the way, they match it also, match it to 6 million current resumes in their database. So within a day, you're going to get it, you know, your resumes are going to roll in, but not to your inbox or your phone, but to the special ZipRecruiter interface. That's really key because you don't want a lot of applicants if you have to handle them in your inbox. No, but here you want them because you can screen them quickly, get the get just the people that match your exact needs, rank them, and then hire the right person fast. Within a couple of days, you can make that hire fast and easy. No wonder 400,000 businesses have used ZipRecruiter, including Twit. One of them, Scott, who heard our ads and started using ZipRecruiter, said the recruiting process, I got his email used to be so painful. Before, I'd post to several places. I'd get a million responses, but only a few from qualified candidates. It was torture. But with ZipRecruiter, we post once. We get qualified candidates in one easy-to-review place. And, and this is the most important part. We've hired some of our best employees using ZipRecruiter. 
Recruiter. That's why I want you to try it right now. And we got a free trial for you, four-day trial, at ZipRecruiter.com slash TechGuy. ZipRecruiter.com slash TechGuy. I want you to try them right now. By the way, if you're looking, ZipRecruiter.com is a great place to go and find a job, too. I just think ZipRecruiter is the awesomest. The awesomest. ZipRecruiter.com slash Tech Guy. We thank them so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Ah, Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Web 5466 has explained what pass through is when it comes to power line networking. Power line networking is so cool. It allows you to use the electrical wiring in your house as a network cable instead of an Ethernet cable. And uh, pass through is. You plug it into the wall, and then there's a plug, a electrical plug coming out of it, so it passes the power through, so you don't lose a plug. That's the difference. Okay, I was th I was thinking networking terms, and trying to figure it out. It's mere, it's electricity pass through, but I do love these. And I now I'm using one from TP-Link. Uh, there are many manufacturers. Uh, I think I chose TP-Link because the wire cutter blog recommended it. Uh, that's probably why, because I, I follow their re recommendations religiously. Speaking of religions, we're all a member of the uh, Holy Gizwiz Roller Society. Here he is, Dick <laughs> D. Bartolo. He, we call him as Gizwiz because he brings us gizmos, and he's a wizard every weekend. Of course, Mad Magazine's maddest writer. Hello, Dickie D. Leo, how are you? I can actually add to your conversation about power line adapters. Have you been using that? Uh, I... I don't know if Belkin still makes them, but Belkin had them. And yes, I said, they did. I want to use my front apartment or my back apartment, but they're on two different electric meters. Ah. And they said, we don't know. Can you tell us? It did work. It did work. It did work. Generally, I say if you're if there's a junction box or you're metered separately, it doesn't. Because you don't want your neighbors to have access to your network. So yeah, it did. that's it actually did. a little scary that it worked. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> and also the people next door said, oh, we love your new uh, belt. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your network. Yeah. Uh. But that's okay because now they're paying my electric bill. So it all works out in the, in the long run. <laughs> what do you have for us this week, Dick? Uh, I have something, something else from Toy Fair from Keno, K-A-N-O. Uh, they have their computer kit for six-year-olds and up. And it's a, a plug-and-play kit that uses the uh, Raspberry Pi 2 oh, as the basis of it. I love the Raspberry Pi. But in instead of, you know, the Raspberry Pi, like for me, I, I don't know how to solder. I don't know how to... Anyway, no, you don't have so to put it together. It just is a computer. It's like a $35 computer, that's all. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, this uh, this comes with a case and a keyboard and uh, a mouse pad. I, it, it's geared toward kids. And then they have a whole uh, structure of parental control so you can make it so that the kids can only go to the keno site where they know what games are playing or they can go into the coding section and they can work on minecraft uh things yeah. to build in minecraft you know, minecraft and on the raspberry pi is awesome i highly recommend it because you can program it with fourth and so you can learn a programming language and for kids who are minecraft obsessed this is so cool so that's great yeah, fourth yeah. and Python, I think, is Python. in the... Yeah, that's yeah, right. In, in what did I say? Kit. I meant to say Python. Uh, fourth. Yeah, no, that's, not that's fourth. Okay. Python. I meant to say Python. Python, yeah. yeah. No, you, you said a boa constrictor, and I said, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sound right. You probably do fourth, but I think Python is more useful these days. Unless you're programming uh, telescopes. Oh, okay. What do you, what does telescopes use? Fourth, fourth was written to, to uh, control telescopes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's often Boy, used in robotics. A, this is a learning show. <laughs> so where can I get this? Uh, okay, so the, it's Kano.me. K-A-N-O? K-A-N-O dot me. It's also uh, at gizwiz.biz. Click on the tech guy. And uh, HDMI out, so you can hook it up to any monitor. They make a monitor kit if you want to build a little monitor, too. So this is, is uh, a Raspberry Pi, but it's just all the uh, stuff you need to go with it. A exactly, yeah. and and the additional games and learning how to do the languages. So nice. And so a, a very nice little keyboard. It's a uh, hundred and forty nine bucks. Yeah. So the Raspberry Pi by itself is thirty five bucks. I bought a kit oh, okay. from Adafruit that was a hundred bucks. So given what you get, which includes a speaker and a keyboard and all that stuff, this is a fairly 
affordable. Uh, you still have to plug it into the TV to use the screen, but yeah, they they make a, a screen kit also, but that's like another hundred. That's expensive. Bucks. Yeah. yeah, this is really great. I, I yeah, and, and then the the, the uh, Kano uh, Camp Club is where kids can play, talk to other kids who built their computers. So it's kind of an interesting concept for the price, and the man. And if you know, if you had a a 12-year-old, 11, 12, 13-year-old who is interested in Minecraft, interested in computers. This is a great starter kit. Highly recommend it. And, some, and a smart younger kid could do it too, I think. Yeah, they said yeah. Six, 6 to 7 and up. Really? That young? That's what they said, Amazing. yeah. Amazing. Kids, kids these days. I know I couldn't do it, so I figured you need a 6-year-old here. This is good. They have a little counter on the front that says 14.9 million lines of code written. So far on the Kano computer. Oh, Padre must be online. <laughs> a resident geek. Geek. Yes. Dickie D is at gizwiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. If you want to follow along, notes on the Kano computer and many other products, the ones he mentions on this show, but also on his podcast, gizwiz.tv, and, of course, on World News Now and other places he appears. Uh, you can also play the What the Heck is a Contest, a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. Perfect. Dickie D will uh, stick around for the Giz Fizz PM in about five hours. Okay, yes, I will. Will you I just will. stay on the line? Week? Yeah, I will. I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, Dennis, well, bring dinner and, and <laughs> breakfast. Okay, bye. And we'll see, and we'll see you next time. Okay, Thank you, Dickie bye. D. Next week, he'll be on, too. By the way, I was looking on the wire cutter. Their recommendation for power line networking is now from Zycel, which is a company that's been around for a long time. You'll recognize the name if you ever bought a high-end modem. They used to make very good smart modems. Uh, Z, uh, X Y Z E L, I think. Anyway, the wirecutter.com. Look at power line networking. Uh, I trust them. They they try a lot more units than I do. And as I said, I've been using a TP Link and uh, and very happy indeed with that. Z-Y-X-E-L, the A-V-2. Thank you. PC Tech in the chat room recommending it. And that has passed through as well. Bob is our last caller from Metuchen, New Jersey. Hey, Bob, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Um, long wait. Well worth the wait, though. I hope so. I'll try to make it worth your while. Thanks for your patience. Sure. I chatted with you before. You know me as Flob. Um, ah, hi, Flob. Hey, during the week, I stumbled across this website called No B4, K N O W B E four. Yes. Kevin Mitnick. Seems yes. Be. Anyway, it seems everything you're talking about for educating the end user because malware bytes and software, the antivirus just doesn't seem to do the job anymore. Something that you might want to have that guy come in and I am a Kevin's an old friend. Uh, in fact, when he got out of prison, because he is a hacker, he was convicted, went to jail, served some time. And uh, when he got out of jail, we had him on our old TV show, The Screensavers. In fact, the first time he got back online, because he was forbidden from going online for many years as part of his parole agreement, it was on our TV show. Steve Wozniak came by, the founder of Apple Computer, gave him an Apple laptop, and we watched him get on the net for the first time in many years. It was kind of a revelation. Kevin's a smart guy. He's reformed. He's a good guy, and he is the king of social engineering, by the way. He knows how all this stuff works, not just software, but, and you're right, that his business is training companies and employees not to fall for this stuff. So thank you for, for reminding me, Flob, because uh, Kevin knows his stuff, and I totally recommend him. Maybe you should get him on your show. I will. With, uh, Steve Gibson. It'd be a phenomenal. You, uh... you you got it. That's a brilliant idea. I haven't talked to Kevin in a couple of years. He we did a we did a triangulation interview with him, an hour interview with him on one of our podcasts. But that's been some time. It's time to get him back. K N. Uh, thank you for the. There, I want to come out in your Tesla. So <laughs> hang on, I'll talk to you after after the year. I'll tell you what's going on with that. K N O W B E the number four dot com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. 
and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.